this evening. It's by Dr. Joe Jindo between Nagami and you'll pronounce it correctly. I'll say Taraki, Buddhism, Monotheism, and Visions from Three Sacred Mountains. So take it away, Joe. Uh, just a second, let me share with you the screen. Here you go. Uh, so um, thank you very much, Monsi Sensei, and everyone for giving me this occasion to give another presentation on Hagami Sensei. Um, if I may, I would like you, uh, those of you who are attending through Zoom to turn off the video uh, during my presentation so that we won't use too much uh, data. Um, after I, uh, I finish uh, the presentation, please uh, turn on uh, your video if possible. So I would like to talk about the relationship between two prominent religious thinkers, Hagami Sensei, uh, he was a Japanese Tendai Buddhist, and uh, Dr. Nathan Andre Shuraki, an Al Algerian Jewish thinker. Uh, Hagami Sensei and the Shuraki Sensei each manifested a distinct synthesis of East and West, and uh, they, they use their mult multicultural background to promote peaceful coexistence ex among different religions, especially among the three monotheistic religions. So I would like to talk about this. And uh, as many of you know, I'm writing a book about Hagami Sensei, and this will be part of the book, one of the book chapters. Um, so let me explain what's the issue. Um, Hagami Sensei and Shuraki uh, Sensei understood the major problem of the three monotheistic religions in the following way. Um, that each of them, uh, uh, Judaism, uh, Christianity, and uh, Islam, uh, tends to claim a monopoly on revelation and truth. So monopolizing God, monopolizing Abraham or Ibrahim or Moshe, Musa, and remains within its own mental ghetto, so to speak, and worse yet, remaining, un uh, remaining unaware of that fact. And so each must, according to Hagami and the Shuraki, each must, each of the three monotheistic religions uh, must leave their own dogmatic get ghettos and undergo a certain uh, degree of uh, self-transcendence right? and share the same sense of destiny and responsibility. Um, in a way, the challenge as they, they saw was whether or not each of the monotheistic, the monotheistic religions can use religion can use religion to accept the outlooks and narratives of the yeah. other religions without compromising one's own. So the story of Hagami Sensei and Shuraki Sensei manifests a distinct kind of a Buddhist, Jewish, West and East relations. And I would like to talk about their relationship as a story of three mountains, uh, uh, Mount Sinai, Mount Ye, and Mount uh, Zion, a.k.a. Jerusalem. So let me start with Mount Sinai. Um, Hagami is, uh, was a Tendai priest and one of the most prominent Japanese Buddhist leaders of the 20th century. Uh, prior to his religious vocation, Hagami was a professor of German philosophy and he taught uh, Western philosophy at the Taisho, at the Taisho University. So he really knew the West or the Western intellectual tradition. Uh, I don't talk about Hagami Sensei because uh, I gave a presentation on Hagami Sensei uh, uh, previously, uh, uh, but uh, here I would like to talk about how Hagami Sensei came to be involved in interfaith activities. And that was through uh, so Asa, uh, Asahina Sogen. Asahina Sogen was a prominent Zen master and uh, he was very active in interfaith worldwide. Uh, he was the head of the religious committee of the World Federation, uh, F Federalist Movement. Here you see uh, uh, Asahina Sogen um, standing at the, uh, 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 this is at, uh, in, in Princeton uh, next to Einstein. Uh, actually, the United States invited uh, Sogen Hagami to uh, promote a better understanding of Japan and Buddhism uh, during the 50, in the, in the, 50, uh, in the 50, 1950s. And uh, Asahina uh, Sogen became physically unwell. Um, and so he asked Hagami to take over many of his interfaith uh, projects. 
Um, it, uh, this was around uh, 1977. So Asahina was uh, 84, uh, 90, 70, 77 or 75. And, uh, and uh, Hagami was about 72. And here what uh, uh, Sogen said to uh, Hagami, everyone talks about world peace, but for that first and foremost, the Catholic Church and Islam must reconcile with each other. Japan is the only country that has been baptized by atomic bombings. Through the advent of uh, nuclear bombs, we have realized that humanity can e extinct its, itself. Why did God choose uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki? It's very interesting that here, you know, uh, Asaki Nasogen is talking to Hagami and he, they, he talks about God. Right? And, and uh, 3,300 years have passed since God gave the Decalogue to Moses at Mount Sinai. As you know, uh, in Buddhism, uh, 33 symbolizes a um, cycle of completion. So uh, uh, Asahi Nasogen thought that uh, a new age is coming. Uh, and, and he says, who know, perhaps to complete that undertaking, God has ordered religious leaders in Japan to take action. I hear that Egyptian President Sadat is a man of great religious conviction. As I see it, now is the time to take initiative. Now, Hagami was very inspired by this, uh, this exchange and he decided to uh, dedicate uh, the remainder of his life to this, uh, this project. Now, Hagami did, did something very smart. He was able to visit and meet President Sadat, but he spent actually two years for preparation. First, he actually um, established uh, close relations with the leaders of Al-Azhar uh, in Cairo. Al-Azhar is one of the most prominent institutions in Sunni Islam, um, and, and, and for sure in uh, Egypt. And especially he formed a very close relationship with the Grand Sheikh of uh, Azhar, uh, Muhammad uh, al-Faham. So um, Hagami invited uh, Faham, uh, he's regarded as, uh, he was then regarded as Islam's Pope uh, in 1975 to Japan, uh, introduced uh, uh, to um, the world of Buddhism, had uh, many interfaith meetings and conferences, and so spent two years uh, back and forth uh, forming a close connections. That was in order to give a theological backing for Sadat. So, and then in, in May 1977, uh, Al-Azhar, uh, that institution invited Hagami to Egypt and arranged a meeting for Hagami with Sadat. And Hagami established then close relations with Sadat and proposed two things. Number one, to make peace with the Jewish people. Um, and then also uh, when the Sinai Peninsula be transferred to Egypt to hold at Mount Sinai, a joint prayer service for world peace by Jews, Christians, and Muslims. So Sadat did both uh, very quickly. He took action uh, uh, in November, 1977. As you know, he, uh, Sadat visited Israel. And then later in, uh, in November, 1979, uh, for Camp David and so forth. And Sadat invited Hagami as a state guest to Mount Sinai where um, they hold uh, joint prayer service for world peace. And, the, and, the, um, and, and the Sadat was able to make this, um, these moves and also make peace with Israel because Al-Azhar Al uh, codified uh, his action. In other words, as, as Al Azhar gave a theological backing or justification to Sadat's actions. At Mount Sinai, then uh, Sadat, uh, not, not Sadat, Hagami was uh, really inspired by that uh, occasion and he uh, decided to uh, promote um, cross religious uh, dialogue among the religious leaders across the world. And for that, uh, he decided to hold a series of religious meeting, uh, summit meetings starting at Mount Hie, which he did in 1987. So it took about uh, uh, eight years, eight years. So that's uh, 
Hagam, uh, that's uh, Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai was very important for Hagami and also for Suraki, but I'm going to skip that uh, later. Uh, not now, but in the handouts on the second page, uh, you can see that a chart where you see that uh, three mountains were important for Hagami and Shuraki as well. Now to, so now let me move to Shuraki and Shuraki's relation to Mount Hiei. Now to Shuraki. Uh, Shuraki was born in Algeria, educated in, Fran uh, in France, and uh, uh, based himself in Israel as public figure and writer. Um, as a public figure, um, he assumed many important roles, including Deputy Secretary General of the Alliance. Uh, those of you who know, this is an organization um, helping uh, Jews across uh, Europe. Uh, and uh, he helped uh, René Cassin uh, in many ways, including uh, drafting the Un Universal Declaration of hu Human Rights. So he, Shuraki helped uh, René Cassin and uh, Eleanor Roosevelt for that. He also, uh, Shuraki uh, served as advisor to Ben Gurion um, for uh, creating a pluralistic society in the state of Israel, uh, interfaith and intercultural dialogue. That was what he was responsible for. And later, deputy, he served as a deputy mayor of Jerusalem, helped Teddy Kolek to retain religious and cultural diversity in Israel. So for uh, Shuraki, that was a real issue um, to, to promote uh, cross-cultural and cross-religious understand a dialogue. As a writer, uh, Shuraki was very prolific. He published about 50, uh, uh, 50 books, five zero. And one of his monumental achievement, ach achievements was his translation of the scriptures of the three monotheistic religions into French. So he translated the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, and the Quran into French. And as, as you can see, um, uh, this is something, um, here's a statement by Shuraki um, uh, right, explaining uh, how he understood his project. What had to be done was to restore the text to its native orient, to decolonize the heroes of the Bible. So uh, as he saw, uh, biblical, uh, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and also the Quran was somehow understood from Western perspectives uh, and that needed to um, rectify, be re that he thought need, needed to be, rec uh, he thought he needed to rectify. So he called this decolonize the heroes of the Bible. And finally, it was necessary to give back to God his true uh, mystery. In other words, not only to liberate the heroes of um, uh, the Abrahamic faiths, but also God also was uh, westernized. So, uh, uh, um, uh, that that was that what underlied uh, his uh, uh, translation project, keeping in mind that ancient the ancient saying of the Tao, the name that can be named is not the eternal name. So uh, for Shuraki, um, Shuraki basically maintained that the Abraham, Abrahamic faiths were essentially of Eastern origin. He called this uh, Orient, uh, and through his translation project, Shuraki tried to reorient the sacred text or reorientalize the sacred text of the Abrahamic faiths, right? highlighting or restoring their Eastern origins that have not received the attention it, uh, um, they deserve in the West. So um, uh, that's what uh, Shuraki did as an author. And I see that there are three as vital aspects here, political, three vital aspects in, the, in his translation project political, theological, and existential. Political, theological, and existential. By political, I mean by promoting the shared sense of Eastern or Oriental heritage, Shuraki thought he could provide Jews and Christians and Muslims this, a shared sense of belongingness and mutual understanding. Part of the reasons why Christians and Muslims are not able to understand with each other, according to Shuraki, was that Muslims thought that Christians were Western. Right? Or, uh, Christianity is of Western origin. So Shuraki thought that it is important to restore uh, uh, the Eastern origins or Middle Eastern or origins of Christianity and reintroduced uh, Christianity to uh, Muslims and vice versa. Uh, so that's political, uh, promoting the shared sense of um, 
Eastern heritage and the sense of uh, promoting the sense of belongingness, uh, uh, having the same roots, uh, realizing that they are brothers or siblings. Uh, second is, is a theological. In, uh, and as I said, in Shuraki's view, the, the Abrahamic God needs to be liberated from Western categories in light of which the reality of this God has long been, uh, 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 right? Western categories uh, through which the reality of this God has long been understood. So that's a theological um, aspect and also existential in that uh, through reorienting themselves, namely Jews, Christians, and uh, Muslims within their Oriental intrinsic background, Ju Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, or they, uh, the believers, can jointly render a distinct service to the enhancement of humanness. So um, with his multicultural background, Shuraki sought to serve as a bridge uh, between or among the three monotheistic religions. Actually, he often mentioned that his name, um, Nathan Andre Shuraki uh, come from three different languages. Uh, Nathan is from Hebrew, God's gift. Andre is from uh, is Greek, man, and Shuraki is Arabic, uh, east. Uh, it's a shark, east or sunrise, uh, Saracen. Uh, right. So together it means God has given a man from the east. So for him, this uh, sense of uh, coming from the east as a blessing to the world. That was very strong. Shuraki was actually um, uh, suggested to become the president of the state of Israel, but he decided not to uh, take that responsibility. Instead, he um, wanted to form um, uh, uh, close relations with uh, the leaders, religious leaders of other countries, including the king of uh, Jordan, uh, Morocco, and so forth, uh, to uh, serve. Uh, 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 how do you say, the enhancement of humanness. Now, Shuraki and Mount Hie. So Mount Hie, as you know, is the headquarters of Tendai Buddhism and the mother mountain of Japanese Buddhism. And uh, Hagami trained himself on Mount Hie for 11 years or 12 years. Now, not only for Hagami, but also for Shuraki, Mount He was a place of transformation. And here you see uh, Hagami uh, sitting next to, um, on the left, uh, Yamada Eta Idazasu. And also uh, he is um, on the right side, you see him uh, at Mount He. Um, Shuraki visited twice Mount He in 1992 and uh, 19, 1989, 1989 and 1992, each for about four days. He uh, fasted and uh, he just uh, did uh, what other monks did. He tried to experience uh, Mount Hie from, from within. Now, um, as I included in the handout, um, here is what Shuraki um, stated, um, um, said about his experience at, at Mount uh, Hie. It's interesting, at Mount Hie in particular and in the East, he said, he um, returned to uh, biblical religion, or he understood what Moses stands for. Right? During my travels in the East, I often thought of Moshe. So he, he, refer, he calls uh, Moses Moshe. This is a Hebrew way of saying. This is part of his, um, uh, his attempt to uh, de-Westernize uh, biblical figures. So he refers to Mo Moses as Moshe. I often thought of Moshe as I discovered more of the splendors of the East, I seemed to get closer to the heroes of the Bible and to the most incomparable of them, Moshe. My biography of Moshe was born in the Buddhist shrines of Mount Hie, where I was an, on retreat, not far from Kyoto, Japan. I had just crossed for the first time the threshold of Jodoi, the paradise inhabited by the Buddha and by a living Buddha called Saicho the founder of Endakuji and Tendai Buddhism. I was penetrated by the beauty of this mystical place in the middle of a forest of maples where the cherry blossoms were bursting with the joy of spring. The silence of Mount Ye was poignant with so much splendor when the chanting of the monks rose. 
dominated by the haunting chant of the Namu Ami Dabutsu, <laughs> repeated ad infinitum by the choir of a nearby monastery. The doors of Jodo Inn only open in front of its servant, the Reverend Kitazawa Kotai, the only man admitted inside the temple forbidden, forbidden to a living soul since the death of Saicho in 822. This Reverend had just completed 12 years of secluded life in the Jodo Inn and to commit to a new period of 12 years, years. When he welcomed me in August 1992, he appeared to me as a living Buddha, radiating light, embodying the virtues of joyful compassion ordained by the Buddha. So Shuraki uses a lot of this uh, light metaphor or light motif. And also when he encountered uh, Hagami, he said he, he really felt a light, a, a light radiating from Hagami. Now, uh, Kitazawa, uh, Mr. Kitazawa uh, uh, to, uh, told me, uh, Shuraki says, that I was the only person, apart from the priest of, on duty, to have been admitted to this sanctuary of sanctuaries since its foundation by Saicho at the end of the eight, eighth century. Why that and why me? I asked my host. Twice he answered me with an enigmatic smile. As I insisted, he ended up answering me, consider Mr. Messenger of Jerusalem, that this is one of many benefits with which your Elohim, God has showered you. It's very interesting that he used the Hebrew word Elohim. It's up upaya. <laughs> In fact, the days spent among the monks of Mount Hiei on the outskirts of silence opened the path for me towards the penetrable mystery of Moshe and the Decalogue, which revealed itself to be as close to Moses as to the jugular vein of Kitazawa Kotai, a monk from another time and another cultural universe. End of the quote. Now, two years later, Shuraki published a 500 page book on this mystery of Moses. It was an attempt to show how to understand and connect to the roots of Moses, his being, so that the three monotheistic religions can relativize its own view of Moses and accept and honor other views without compromising its own. So it's like, a, you know, Moses beyond Moses, right? Eckhart, a great German mystic uh, said, there's a God beyond gods, right? So it's like Moses, Moses beyond Moshe, Moses, Moshe, Moses beyond the Musa, Moshe beyond the Moses and so forth. Right? And uh, here's a book uh, uh, by Andre Shurak. If you see on the right side right, in French, it says, this is a, a prologue, um, the silence of Mount Hiei, Namu Ami Davids. So this is the Shuraki and Mount Hie. Now let me move to the third mountain, Jerusalem. Um, and here on the left side, you see uh, Hagami and Shuraki meeting uh, with uh, uh, sitting next to each other. They actually wanted to have a uh, hold um, religious summit meeting at, uh, at Jerusalem uh, as a sequel to uh, the religious summit meeting uh, held on Mount Hie. Hie. In, uh, in when was 19, 19, 1989 or 87, 89. Right? So for Haga, now I, I, I put here subtitle Jerusalem Danger and Hope. So for Hagami and Shuraki, Jerusalem manifests both danger and hope. Why danger? Because each of the three monotheistic religions tends to claim mon mon monopoly over it. It is sacred to me, therefore it is mine and only mine, and I cannot compromise. So it's a danger. If three monotheistic religions claim monopoly over the same mountain, the inevitable result is the conflict. But uh, Hagami and Shuraki also saw hope uh, in Jerusalem because 
the three religions, uh, is, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all regard Jerusalem as sacred. And if they really appreciate or understand um, what we can call the transcendence of Jerusalem, in other words, if it is really sacred and transcendent, transcendent, then nobody can own it. Hence, nobody can claim that this is mine, this is ours. Then the three monotheistic religions can acknowledge each other's relations to Mount, Jeru uh, Mount, Mount Zion or Jerusalem and celebrate, celebrate unity in diversity and diversity in unity in and through Jerusalem. And here I'm using the word unity instead of uniformity. So acknowledging diversity, but also acknowledging oneness among them. So unity in diversity and diversity in unity, not in, not in uniformity. And Shuraki as a former vice mayor of Jerusalem was especially aware, aware of this duality of Jerusalem. Danger, Jerusalem as danger, Jerusalem as a hope. And as I said earlier, to overcome this and other issues, Hagami and Shuraki plan to hold a religious summit meeting in Jerusalem in 1990, 1990, 1990 to be participated by representatives of world religions, but Hagami died before its fruition in 1989. I'm gonna say two more things and I open a, um, a I would like to have the time for cues, questions and answers. Um, another, I would say two more thing, things. One is experience and encounter. For conducting religious dialogue, uh, Hagami and Shuraki, um, they really um, put emphasis on the importance of experience and encounter. What do I mean by experience and encounter? Both Hagami and Shuraki, um, uh, how do I put this? Um, their, their take on religion and interfaith was uh, experiential rather than theological. They took theology seriously, but they also maintained that theologies are inev inevitably limited because you need to use human categories, which are limited vis-a-vis -vis the ultimate. Also for Hagami and Shuraki, what, change, what changes people is not theology or knowledge, but experience and encounter. So forming relationships uh, allow people to recognize that there is something beyond symbols and categories that separate them as different religions and cultures. That's why it was very important for Hagami to visit people, go to Egypt, meet people. That was why for Shuraki as well, it was important to go to Mount Hie and so forth and to experience and encounter. Now, <laughs> I was hesitant to, I was uh, yeah, debating whether I should say, uh, make a, uh, a comment on the following point, which is the third point, <laughs> but I'm gonna do this anyway. Okay, so this is a threefold truth. Right? Who am I to talk about the threefold truth? Right? But uh, it, it seems to me that both Hagami and Shuraki understood the experiential how do I say this? The importance of the threefold truth, right? This is the essence of Tendai Buddhism. Uh, and, and they understood the importance of this category or this no, notion as an experience, not as a dogma or not as um, a, not as a, a notion or abstract notion. So what is the, the threefold truth? Uh, I would, ex this is my explanation, okay. Um, all existence is conventionally real. Right? Anything that we experience in this world is conventionally real, the truth number one. And yet at the same time, ultimately empty, empty of intris intrinsic nature. This is the second truth. And the ability to perceive and experience both aspects holistically is called the middle. This is a third truth which is what enables us to appreciate all things as manifesting the true aspect of reality. Um, in other words, uh, what we thereby come to recognize is that all existence is within our reach, but beyond our grasp, right? So this is something that uh, Hagam, uh, Shuraki also experienced at Mount Sinai. Moses, there is Moses beyond Moses or Moses is, so to speak. So Moses, yes, 
it's conventionally real, but at the same time, in order really to understand the existence or uh, truth of Moses, uh, one has to also recognize the other aspect uh, that Moses is ultimately empty and develop the ability to see th those two aspects uh, holistically. The same thing can be said about Jerusalem and so forth. So um, these are the points that I wanted to highlight, uh, uh, share with you. I can, I can go on and on and on, but uh, I think I should stop here my part and uh, hear your comments, questions and reflections. Thank you very much. Yeah, so please turn on your uh, video. Thank you, Joe. That was really very interesting. What, what questions do we have? And uh, Hoshin, I'll ask you, since you're closer to the screen, if you see somebody with their hand up. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Wynne has a question. Joe, why did you hesitate? Why were you hesitant to that, that very last, very succinct question I had written? On my well, who am I? Who am I to give a definition of a threefold truth <laughs> in one paragraph? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. I see. Uh, Mushin Sam wants to make yeah. a comment. What, was Shiraki responsible for uh, Sadat and? Uh, I'm sorry, the president of Israel getting together. And I, I, that, that was rather, well, Hagami was the one who really uh, urged uh, Sadat to make peace with um, the state of Israel. Right? Yeah. And, and from the Jewish side, my understanding was after that, after the Camp David, uh, Shuraki also became involved in uh, Solidifying that relationship. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Kyren, please. Yeah, so this might be kind of a simple question for you, Joe, but um, you mentioned uh, Shiraki's book on on Moses as something that was that was influential that you kind of examined a little bit. Do you have any recommendations on uh, on a good starting place if somebody wanted to sort of get an overall feel for Shiraki's sort of mission? I'm kind of interested in this idea of uh, like decolonizing the heroes of the various world religions. Right. So Shiraki is known outside, outside of the you know English speaking uh, uh, world. Uh, yeah, I have some books uh, that I can recommend. So I, I will send, actually some of the, yeah, his writings really need to be translated. If you want, there is an, he wrote an autobiography in English. Uh, in, his autobiography was translated into English. So that may be one of the places, but there you don't see so much talking about uh, his uh, encounter with Eastern religions. Um, that happened uh, in 1990s to the end of, and the autobiography was written in 1984, five, something like that. Yes, Kaiwen knows French. He well, might be able to. Sure. Yeah. Let me ask a question first and then, and then Chip. And the question is, it, it struck me when you're talking about, and I, I, I really find the notion that Shiraki was promoting, and that is to reorientalize, if you will, uh, the monotheistic religions. But it also made me think about um, Edward Said and the writings of Edward Said in, rel in relation to uh, Oriental. Uh, what is the Oriental? And I wondered if, if Said and Shiraki had any correspondence that you're aware of. Uh, I, I'm not so much aware of the relations. I know that Shuraki, he really knew people. He was a friend of uh, Albert Camus and other people. Uh, Shuraki was fighting uh, against, uh, 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 along with uh, uh, Camus uh, for the uh, liberation of uh, Algeria and also against Nazis. Um, as I see, Said, he tended to emphasize on the conflict, right? He was not interested in a cross-religious dialogue. He was more interested in, you know, 
Right. Uh, and just, right. Whereas Shuraki, he acknowledged that, you know, there were, there, there are issues, there are harms done in the past, but the challenge was to how to overcome. And Shuraki, he was fluent in Arabic, fluent in English, French, uh, Hebrew. So he knew really each of those cultures from within. So that, yeah, that's what, I guess that's what I find fascinating. What would a conversation between Saeed and Shiraki have been like? You know, yeah. <laughs> I, guess, I guess it would be speculative. So I, I mean, and Chip had a question. Uh, who is carrying on the, the vision that Shiraki and, and Hagami had? Is so, there, uh, so, 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 um, <laughs> Job <laughs> Jindo. <laughs> so um, two things. Uh, uh, Hagami's disciple, one and only disciple, Yokoyama Sensei, he is the one who now really uh, trying to um, uh, promote Hagami's uh, vision. And so he started to visit every year uh, to Israel to meet leading figures. And I'm helping him. Uh, as a translator, and uh, the, the circle is getting uh, larger and larger. Uh, and so um, his, uh, Hagami's uh, disciple uh, is really one of the key people who are trying to promote this idea. And uh, I also would like to do, not as a Buddhist, but, uh, you know, uh, Hagami show uh, what Tendai Buddhism can do. Right? And, uh, it seems to me that you have this treasure, jewels, and uh, we're discovering the jewels that the Tendai Buddhists have. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> and uh, this year actually marked the 33rd anniversary of Hagami Sensei's passing. So this is also a, a symbolic year. Any other comments? Yeah, what, what is Hagami's uh, uh, disciple's name? Uh, Shocho, uh, no, 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 Sho, uh, Yokoyama Shotai, Shotai Yokoyama. So, uh, 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 Shingaku, uh, 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 Shingaku is going to uh, Mount Hie. Uh, if, Shingaku, if I can, he's the current um, Gyoincho yeah. at uh, Mount Hie, Enrakuji. So, he's the head of the training at Enrakuji. Oh. Uh, has been in the past and is currently the Gyoincho. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, the group that's in the house is going to have to vacate and go into the hondo in just a moment. And I'd like to thank Joe very much for your presentation. And um, it was really elucidating and I'm really fascinated to read what you end up coming up with and your presentation next month. <laughs> um, I wanted to thank Job again for his presentation tonight. Um, I'm coming to coming to realize just how much there sh should be said about the my sensei. So I'm I'm enjoying learning along the way. Um, and for me, it seems um, it seems that. Um, I'm very appreciative of his, of his devotion to what seems like devotion to humanness. Um, Job used the term earlier and it, it strikes me um, because it's, it seems to me as if uh, it's our ability to take each other as we are um, and find commonalities rather than divides. It's a celebration of the power of coming together in, in different ways from different perspectives for a common cause. If we look at our own teachings, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, for example, alone can give us a way of how to view and interact with the world. If we are actively living a Buddhist Dharma and are honest and true, to treat all beings equally without disparagement or rebuke, to realize our universal samsaric existence, and if I ever get there, I'll let you know. Um, we can, if we can only embody some of this foundation, these foundational teachings, we can see past, hopefully, the differences, find 
unity, harmony, and, and presumably a momentum that can get us through tough, difficult things, changes that are happening through with this larger sense of larger than self community. It's, it, we are hardwired neurologically to see differences. It, so it ain't easy. Uh, we are, we differentiate. We have concepts that separate us. But interfaith dialogue is a way to start to blur the use of conceptual lines between things and especially faith traditions. When we live our faith, despite the perspective, there is a connection, can be a connection, only, <clears throat> that can only be experienced when you get past the surface differences. Develop a greater sense of Sangha, working together with a similar intention and purpose. So as Buddhists, we wear the Dharma in our actions, trust in our path, and allow others to have their own. Even the raft that takes us to the other shore towards awakening, that raft is left behind. The Buddha Dharma is shunyata, suchness, conditioned, a vehicle, a way, one that I trust wholeheartedly. But I also recognize that it's the way I choose to organize my reality. We should be curious then to listen on how other people organize their reality. When, when we see not the differences, but the commonalities, our humanness, we start to understand our interdependence. And for the quote, in the context of interfaith encounter, we need to bring to the surface how our actual beliefs shape what we do not simply to agree that kindness is better than cruelty. <laughs>